last season has it, it's been bizarre, right? I, I mean, nobody saw this coming. My, my, my wife mentioned we sit on a prophetic council of a group of prophets and different people. I actually think I'm there because my wife has been invited. But, but Mama Cindy says, no, both of you, come on, come on, come on. But we sat around and we talked about each year, they'll pray and people will submit their words, pray, and as an apostolic or a prophetic gathering, we'll go like, this is what we feel the Lord is saying. And so a couple years back, 2019, it was 2020, year of vision. We will see. It's going to be a year of breakthrough. It's going to be a year of fulfillment. How many of you know, I mean, I heard some great prophetic words, but most of them kind of just was in the ballpark. Like, like, I don't think anybody saw that little one, one billionth of a yardstick virus, coronavirus, the Rona be gonna. Come on, somebody. I don't think nobody saw that coming, right? My wife actually was the closest one. And she says that 2020, she said that 2019 would be a year of interruptions, a year of not keeping your schedule, a year of you're going to have to align yourself with the purposes of God. Nobody saw it coming. And then boom, it hit us. What we thought was going to be two weeks. That's what I thought. I thought, okay, two weeks, and then it progressed, and then it, the, the, the virus can't survive summer months, and then the virus must have put suntan lotion on because it survived the summer months and made it into the year. We're going to begin 2021. We won't have to deal with this thing. And then 2021, and it's kind of like that old parent trap where the maid looks and finds out Lindsay Lohan, the girl, you know, they were twins and she's looking at, oh, oh, it's like, I'm looking at 2020 and 2021. Like, man, there's two of you, right? I believe that there was a lesson to learn and I want to begin there. I believe the lesson of the pandemic was to not put our hope in undeserving sources. Hey, right? I feel like the Lord highlighted the utter inability of idols and man's programs and think tanks to figure our way out of this thing, right? Scientists may promise new treatments. Politicians may promise procedures and safety through contact tracing, lockdowns, etc. Pundits may offer quick fix solutions, but at the end of the day, they were simply stop gaps at best stop gaps in a larger human question. Centuries ago, a king of the unified monarchy of Israel and Judah said it this way. You know him as King David. He dropped wisdom in Psalms 119 when he said, some will trust in chariots, some will trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. And then he says in that Psalms, they will collapse and fall, but we will hold and stand firm. Now, oh my God, never before has a simple childlike faith in Jesus Christ and trusting in the goodness of our Father been more important. That the devil wants us to drink on his satanic bottle of despair. But God, I believe, is speaking to me that we're on the tipping point of a third great awakening. The greatest number of people that will ever be saved are about to be saved. The greater works era that Jesus prophesied is being ushered in. What filled up tents in the late 1940s and 50s, 12 year olds would do on street corners and put on YouTube channels of legs growing out and praying for folks getting up out of wheel. I was out of conference where this happened with the kids. We had this conference at the Gibson Theater to in Southern California, Universal Studios, and I did some teaching and some another friend of mine teaching on prophetic evangelism. The kids went into City Walk and two people got up out of wheelchairs in City Walk. Come on, all Roberts and Catherine Coleman. Come on now. So let me give you three things I got out of this season. Three things that I feel like the Lord's saying. And that's not even my message. It's still my intro, okay? <laughs> three things we got out of season. Number one, I believe we've been given a chance to reassess our future in lives of in 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 light of what has transpired. Let me say that again. I messed it up. We have been given a chance to reassess our lives in light of the future. I believe this whole pandemic is about us redeeming the time for the day is evil. Now follow me. I think we all knew we were in the end times. I've been hearing that since I got saved. End times, end times. Something about 2020 seems so apocalyptic. I'm starting to believe we're in the end, end times. Just wave your hands in the air. Throw your rollie in the sky. Come on, somebody. I'm quoting, quoting Biggie in the pulpit. All right, man. You know, I'm, I got the anointing now, man. 
Throw your rollies in the sky, wear them side to side. Never mind. All right. We've been given a chance to reassess our lives. And, and I want to say with a smile, woe unto us if we don't. Woe unto us if we just kind of blindly kind of waltz into a year and treat this season like we did the last season. This thing has been a wake-up call. And, and, and they got woke culture out there, but we need to have a wake culture in here. We need to awake for the awakening. And this is what God is saying. Because why? You're called to a bigger story. We're called to a bigger story. And whatever it is that maybe has been our preoccupation, you're called to a bigger narrative in terms of allowing kingdom initiatives to impact earthly spheres, aka revival, awakening, greater works right now than ever before. The summons have been issued. Number one, we've been given a chance to reassess our lives in the light of the future. Number two, Second thing that I have observed that I believe we got out of this last season, that the scattered church has greater potential than the gathered church. Let me explain that. The scattered church, how many of you know when this first happened, we weren't meeting in buildings. And we in California, we, we relied behind all y'all for the most part. But all of a sudden, I think our concept of church was not just how many we could get in a building, but it wasn't about the building, it was about the people. And all of a sudden, church was wherever folks could meet, which was very few places in California. But all of a sudden, I think we got the idea of getting outside the four walls, getting outside the stained glass windows. Come on, somebody needs to help me on this. Getting outside and impacting the community. And we discovered the scattered church. Come on, Book of Acts. A little bit of persecution scattered the church. The scattered church has more potential than the gathered church. I'm not against us gathering. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is that it's good that God gives us something. It's better that we give the world something. You owe them an encounter, as Bill Johnson says. And then the third observation is what I realized is I found a blueprint. Second Chronicles 7.13. We often quote Second Chronicles 7.14. And I see that number 7.14 all the time. 7.14. I, I know it's twice a day on the clock. But I see it's like the Lord is always reminding me, Sean, this is it. But seven, Second Chronicles 7.13 says, At times I may shut up the heavens so that no rain falls. California's in a drought right now and fires. Lord help us. Or command grasshoppers to devour your crops. Or send plagues among you. Now make no mistake, I'm not saying that God sent coronavirus, but in his divine wisdom, he's allowed a plague to bring about a global pause. How many of you are okay with that theology? Just wave at me. We know every good and perfect gift comes down from above the father of lights within whom there's no variation or shifting shadow, but follow me. He's saying in second Chronicles 7 13, now I'm going to read it without my commentary. At times I may shut up the heavens so that no rain falls, command grasshoppers to devour your crops, or send plagues among you. And now, again, there's no comma. This wasn't written like it's written in, in holy narrative. It immediately says, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. And so here is my third observation. Could this be the Rona triggered revival that after the drought, after the pestilence, the people of God radically turn to God like they've never turned to God before. And in the midst of it, we have something we haven't seen in a generation in America. I, now, I'm not the revival police, but I think we use that word pretty freely and loosely. No problem with that. I'm not called to, to guard the semantics of revival. I believe we've had stirrings, we've had outpourings, we've had awakenings, but I think we're going to have to go a ways back to really describe a revival because I'm not talking about the water you can fill in a thimble when God wants to give me Lake Superior. And if I say special meetings that extended here and there, but a community wasn't transformed, I call that revival, then I'm okay with something staying in the house. I'm telling you, you're not okay with that. I'm not okay with that. I'm searching for a kingdom whose builder and maker is God. I want something that will bring a glistening to the countryside, to the landscapes of communities and cities. Am I yelling right now? I just feel like, man, I'm yelling right now. The Lord wants us to learn from our history. Have you been wondering why maybe God allowed the closing of churches? I know churches have opened back up, 
but there was limited seating and then they got mass section and unmass section and all that. I didn't have, I don't claim to have the answer, but I found something in Malachi 1.10. It says in Malachi 1.10, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors. Again, I'm asking, answering the question, do you ever wonder why God allowed the closing of the doors of the church, not just in America, but many nations? Malachi 1.10 says, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you may not light useless fires on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord God Almighty. Now, I'm not about to go hardcore thump on you, but notice why God allowed the closing of the doors in terms of the nation of Israel out of the mouth of the prophet Malachi. He says, because you've allowed a substitute, right? That's what he's saying. You've allowed useless fires instead of real fires. And so all of this leads to one word. Here is the word substitutions. I don't know about you. I grew up inner city Oakland. You know, I had to tell anybody's heard me preach. I got to talk about, I grew up inner city Oakland. I grew up hood y'all. I mean, hood rat, but I got saved and I became hood radical. Okay. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. Uh, we, we were economically challenged, which means we was po, P-O, po, not poor. We didn't have enough money to buy our other vow from Vanna White on Wheel of Fortune. And Pat Sajak doesn't accept food stamps, so we was just po. When poor people call you poor, you lose your O and R by virtue of disrespect. You're simply po. Growing up as a kid, I rarely had any major brands in our home. I don't know if you grew up like that. Like to say we had generic food, that was literally it. I mean, I, there was a generic brand when I came up that some of y'all remember, it was just white in terms of the brand and it had a black, like block, like font and it would be bread. Like you wasn't getting Wonder Bread, you was getting bread, right? You wasn't getting Clorox, you were getting bleach. Come on, somebody. You wasn't getting Charmin, you were getting paper towels. Anybody remember that, that season, right? In our home, we didn't get Coca-Cola, we got Shasta-Cola. Like, all I gotta say is, ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Right? It was a substitute for the real thing. We didn't have 7-Up, we had Craigmont Lemon Lime Soda, which my, my grandma would say, baby, it tastes just like 7-Up. You ever been someplace, and I love to try different foods in different areas, and then they'll try to talk you into whatever they're getting, wanting you to eat. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name, Lord. We just pray the power of God. I love this. Lord, we pray healing. We pray deliverance. We pray Jesus would come on the scene. We pray intervention. We pray breakthrough. Come on, let me just tell you something. You better get used to that. That's a sign the presence of the Lord is here. I'm telling you, there, there's going to be, I prophesy, there's going to be more deliverances in local churches in the house of God. I'm tired of the demonic, and I believe there are also some other issues. I'm tired of the demonic hiding up in our churches. I'm tired. Hey, hey, if the witches and the wicked groups are going to send their representatives in church, I don't want them coming in there in our house cursing us. I want them walking out blessed by us. You gonna get saved or you gonna get out? Oh! <laughs> Woo! I was thinking about substitutes. Even the fashion industry has substitutes, right? There's a whole replica market. We were I was talking about that the other day. Ray-Bans, Rolex, Nike, Supreme, Louis Vuitton are some of the most, right now, copy brands worldwide. Knockoff substitutes, right? The sellers swear they're just like the real thing, but they're not. People tell you, that I mentioned, they'll say, try this meat. It tastes just like chicken. Anybody ever got that before? You taste it, and come on, somebody. It don't taste like chicken. I like chicken right now, right? I love one of my favorite meats. But I just have observed something. I've come to a conclusion, core value of Sean Smith. I'd rather have chicken than something that tastes just like it. Right? Touch somebody and say, accept no substitutes. Come on, touch somebody. Why is that important? Because I believe this last season, we've had to deal with substitutes, right? Some good, some bad. Many people had to work from home in terms of a makeshift office, substitute. Kids were on the Zoom for their classroom, substitutes. We couldn't go out for dinner and a movie, come on somebody. So it was a microwavable and a Netflix, come on somebody. We had to substitute, right? But here is the more dangerous aspect of substitutes. And remember, 
We read Malachi says the doors of the church closed because you substituted, if you will, a painted fire or artificial fire, substitute fire for the real fire. That's why the doors got shut, right? Now listen to me. I believe many believers have substituted virtual church carrying a cup of coffee on a couch rather than vibrant assembly together for the contending for the presence and the power of God to break out. I understand some people have some genuine health risk. I understand that. Okay. So pause. Amen. But it's funny how you made it back to Walmart. You made it back to uh, Target. You made it back to Home Depot, but you can't make it back to the house of God. I like my chances of getting healed here. Then I like my chances. I'd rather be in this aisle than aisle six at Home Depot because I might be like this, that one right there. Then over there, I, I like my chances here. There's only so much you can get watching it online. I get it. Health risk. Amen, amen, amen. Be wise. But I'm telling you, some folks have just used this as an excuse and the enemy has brought a dangerous substitution. Now, why is that important? Because here is what I sense God saying to us. And listen to this. Listen clearly. I hear the Spirit of the Lord says, the season of substitutes are over. That ought to get you excited. I don't want to substitute for the anointing via entertainment. Rather than an entertainment, I'd rather have the anointing. I don't want personality. I want presence. Come on, somebody. I don't want a program. Come on, somebody. I want revival to penetrate hearts. I don't want any more substitutes. Church substitutes. Christian substitutes. The Lord closed the door. I believe over substitutes. He's opened the door for a church going after the real thing because there ain't nothing like the real thing. Come on. The presence of the Lord. At the dawn of the 20th century, William Booth, the great founder, he and his wife, Catherine Booth, the great founder of, of the Salvation Army, and it's known today more of a, for its social wing, but it was really kind of more like a dream center, kind of evangelistic discipleship movement that swept the UK, William Booth. At the dawn of the 20th century, William Booth was asked what he thought would be the greatest danger for the century ahead. Listen to what this great man of God said over a century ago. William Booth said, I consider the chief dangers that confront the century ahead would be religion without the Holy Ghost. Substitute. Christianity without Christ. Ooh. Forgiveness without repentance. Come on, somebody. Flaky grace. That's what that's talking about. Salvation without regeneration. Politics without God. And that works for either side of the aisle. I'm, I'm going to step on a little toes and I'll back back up. Come on, whether you're the left wing or the right wing, the whole bird is sick. We need the dove of God to land on America. Come on, the answer is found in Jesus Christ. It's in the blood. It's in the name. I'm not accepting any substitute for the salvation redeeming vehicle for a generation. It is going to be the church. It is not going to be a political party. We need to get our eyes back on the one that sits on the white throne. Come on. His name is... William Booth was prophesying substitutes. He's saying the greatest danger is going to be substitutes. Vance Havner, a great pulpit orator, is quoted as saying, we don't need more programs on file. We need more people on fire. We don't need more programs on file. We need more people on fire. Oh, I think the modern church, we've learned how to be pretty. We've learned how to do presentation. We learned how to have big screens, smoke machines, and skinny jeans, which I think we've had all of them because your speaker is wearing some skinnies. <laughs> we've learned to have char char charismatic personalities rather than how to have a charismatic penetration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've had a watered down, diluted gospel that allows people to live whatever way they want to live rather than allowing the Bible to be their plumb line and to call truth. I believe that we have this displays, we have the screens, we have the stage, we have the mood, we have the atmosphere. It all plays into modern state-of-the-art worship service. But 
tragically the presence is missing the realm of encounter is missing the revived transformation of people that will come and sit up in church and walk out differently right is missing and it's because we've allowed some sort of substitute and i believe that god brought you here to greater works because you're and and dr tom said it because this is a group that's hungering for the more we're not going to accept no craig mont cola we want the real thing baby come on somebody we don't want virtual we want actual we don't want to just zoom in come on somebody we want to be zapped by come on somebody we want the true genuine if you want the genuine give the lord a hand clap a shout a praise Nothing can duplicate, nothing can replicate, nothing can authenticate but the presence of God and we have to have that. Now, saying all that, let me get to this. Revivals often, as I've studied revivals, they come after disruptions. How many of you know we've never had a greater disruption than we've had this past year? Which leads me to believe the greater the disruption, the greater the revival. Let me say this again. Revivals have always come after disruptions. All of them. And, and let me tell you what I felt like. I, I got this picture. I felt like the Lord says there's been a heart defibrillator paddle put on the church. The church of the nations of the world. The universal church. And the church here as we're talking in Oklahoma City. The church in America. Did you know that the primary purpose for a heart defibrillator paddle is to disrupt a disorganized heart? Oh, y'all didn't hear me. Let me say this again. Do you know that the, I'm going to say a lot over the people in the back. Okay. Do you know the purpose of a defibrillator paddle is to disrupt a disorganized heartbeat? The heart isn't beating right and it wants to shock it back where it's rhythmic. I believe the Lord has allowed defibrillator paddles that our hearts would begin to beat with heaven once again. That there would be alignment. There would be syncopation. Come on, somebody. There would be, oh my God. All right. Second Chronicles 12. And I'm not going to take long to unpack that because I felt like I was supposed to emphasize those things. But let me, let me cue this up. Second Chronicles 12 and starting at verse 12, it says, But when Rehoboam was firmly established and strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord. And I think kind of maybe the church, at least in America, I'll tell on us a little bit. I think we got a little strong in ourselves. And notice what happens when you get strong in yourself. Rehoboam Begin. He's a son of Solomon. This dude is reigning over God's people. There was a heart placed in him to worship and honor God, but the dude has fallen away from it. It says, when Rehoboam was firmly established and strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord, and all Israel followed him in his sin. Because they were unfaithful to the Lord, King Seshach of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign. He came with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horses, and a countless army. Somebody say countless of foot soldiers, including Libyans, Sukkites, Ethiopians. Seshach conquered Judah's fortified towns and then advanced to attack Jerusalem. The prophet Shemaiah then met with Rehoboam and Judah's leaders who had all fled to Jerusalem because of Seshach. Shemaiah said, this is what the Lord says. You've abandoned me, so I'm abandoning you to Seshach. I'm not emphasizing that, but now jump to verse 9. Here's what I want to emphasize. So King Seshach of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem. He ransacked the treasuries of the Lord's temple, royal palace. He stole everything. Somebody say, he stole everything. Come on, this is the Grinch still in the last can of who has and a little crumb that fell from the mouse on the Grinch that stole Christmas right here. Seshach is stealing everything. And it says... He ransacked the treasures of the Lord's temple, the royal palace. He stole everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. King Rehoboam, listen to this, verse 10, later replaced them with bronze shields as substitutes. I'm going to say substitutes. And he entrusted them to the care of the commanders of the guard who protected the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the temple of the Lord, the guards would also take the shields and then return them to the guard room. Here is King Rehoboam, and he's going to be, and his nation's going to be in crisis. He is responsible for seeing the split between the northern portion of the kingdom, southern portion of the kingdom, King Jeroboam, King Rehoboam, and in the midst of it, it all happened because he began by taking the wrong advice. When he became, if you will, in office, the older people were speaking to him, and they were speaking about unity. 
They were speaking about, if you will, this classic plumb line of how to reign. He was, they were giving him etiquette. They were giving him political savvy. They were giving him literally how to be faithful and honor God and how to honor the generations that have gone before you. But the Bible is clear. King Rehoboam literally disregarded the advice of the older age and decided, I'm going to go with modern culture. And I'm going to listen to it. It says he listened to the wisdom of the young people. And he said, hey, man, come on, listen to me, Rayborn. Let the people know your father, he was easy on him. But you're going to be a heavy weight on a nation. He listened to him, split the kingdom. Which leads me to this kind of first point, right? The first point of what ruptures faith is when you listen to advice by people that aren't advised by God. I have a core value. My core value is that, hey, if I got to unclog my sink, I may go to a YouTube tutorial and I can get wisdom from you. But if I'm going to make a major life decision, I will not be advised by those who aren't advised by the counsel of Scripture and the Spirit of God. So often we've allowed people to speak in our life. We've allowed the entertainment industry to snatch up the heart of a generation. We've listened to the so-called experts on the hundreds of channels on cable television, and we have not consulted. And amen, it's awesome, you know, whatever good maybe Oprah may do. But I'm telling you what, it isn't what Oprah says. It's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John says. Come on, somebody. Unless he's quoting scripture, the devil doesn't have to back off somebody's opinion. Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Come on, somebody. It's the word. It ruptured the kingdom. And I feel like you can't take your cues from those that have no clue. I've seen far too many Christians have more confidence in their media, right? and the voice of modern culture than they do the word of God and a prophetic word. And whether you're, that media for you is MSNBC, whether that's CNN or yea, even Fox News, I'm gonna have more faith in the prophetic word of the Lord. They're painting a picture. And I love to tell folks, we click like on different pictures on Instagram of our friends and people that we like and we agree with. Do not click like on the devil's Instagram. Don't come, click unlike break agreement and begin to click like on Jesus' picture of what America's future and the future of the nations of the world are going to be. Now, wisdom is important and he lost wisdom. And I feel like we got to get back to Jesus is the one that has the ultimate wisdom. And what Jesus is going to speak in this hour is going to be counterproductive. One of the things that God is doing is he's calling the church out of her comfort zone because you cannot have revival in your comfort zone. I guarantee you that one of the things that God does on the onset of revival is he attacks all comfort zones. Come on, somebody ought to shout amen because y'all got your uh, <laughs> comfort zones attacked. What happened to Rehoboam is he lost his biblical baseline, if you will. Obviously, the Bible isn't written, but he's not aligning himself with the Torah. He's not aligning himself with the prophets. And as a result of that, he lost something. Now, here's the part I want to move on to. It says, as a result of that, this dude of Egypt named Seshach came and attacked. It was the Seshach attack. And Seshach came and noticed there was disunity in the body. Come on, somebody. He understood like, okay, man, I'm reading your Facebook posts and I see, man, you're ranting on that group over here and that group of Christians ranting on them. And let me tell you what, let me just suggest something to you. The world looks at our Facebook and social media. Let's have the disposition of the father. Let's WWJD when we're posting. Come on, somebody. It, you, you're going off on people and you don't realize what you're doing is you're shoot, shooting the body of Christ in the foot. Remember how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. You're giving the gospel a black eye by trying to prove your political point. And right now, we need Jesus. Come on. We need raw Jesus. We don't need to substitute. I got some folks that have shot me down. But even if you don't, I'm going to speak it. Because anything you mix with the gospel weakens the gospel. We got to get back. Hey, I'm going to vote to protect babies in the womb. I'm going to vote, you know, as I believe is biblical. Hey, amen on that. But on top of that, let me tell you something. I want God to reach folks on the far left. I want God to reach. I want Nancy Pelosi to get saved. I'm, come on, somebody. I, I, I don't have the luxury to demonize folks. I'm called to free. I can't do that. Come on, somebody. I want Kamala Harris to get born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost. Come on. 
I want President Biden to get an encounter in his Catholic mass. Come on, somebody. I want Mayor Como to get right. Come on, somebody. And I want the Republican Party to get saved, born again, and Christ-like. Hashtag drop mic. That's all that was right there, all right? c Shack came, and in one of the parallel writers, it says that he first came to Rehoboam's house. I believe sometimes, excuse me, he first came to the temple, then he came to Rehoboam's house. Correction. I believe sometimes the devil will come to church, and he'll come to try to hijack. You know what a hijack is? Is a plane is launch to read a certain certain reach a certain destination somebody gets on board with an alternate destination i believe sometimes the enemy will try to hijack a church hijack a church service and begin to get us on substitute causes rather than the real cause and i believe that if we don't war against that in the church remember he came to jerusalem stole everything c shack but then he sold everything out of the palace notice the sequence the temple then the palace the king's palace that was his house I believe the enemy will come and test you and he'll come to try to hijack purposes and concerns in the greater body of Christ. And if we don't fight against the devil there, he's under the impression he can come to your house and begin to rob your kid's destiny, begin to rob the quality of your marriage, begin to get in the health of mama and them. I believe we got to let the devil know, no, if you don't fight here, come on, Sunday morning is the high water mark for the church. That's as prayed up, as worship up, as Jesus focused as some folks that get. And if you're not going to fight the devil there, come on, I've been in church services where I could tell the enemy's hijacking a service and I'm looking for somebody to stand up and start pacing, crying out in the Holy Ghost, praying in their heavenly language I'm looking for some intercessors I'm looking for somebody to throw up some sackcloth and ash I'm looking for some sisters to lose a weave for Jesus I need some folks that's gonna battle I need some come on I need some rough and ready saints come on I need somebody that got some elephant calluses on their knees because they know how to get hold of God I don't need that hipster stuff I need that hallowed stuff I need hallowed be thy name I need come on I need some warriors right now because if we don't fight the enemy here, he's under the impression he can follow you home. It says that King Seshach came. Now here's what happens. Solomon in his splendor and the glory of the temple, he had made 300 gold shields. That modern equivalent, and I just got to go with them. It says it was close to $60 million. And I don't even know if, how accurate that could be. So it represented... Follow me. The gold shields represented the glory, the glory of the temple, the glory of God's house. It represented, if you will, a gold standard of what should portray what God does when he visits and bless. And remember when the temple was filled, the presence of the Lord came and the priest couldn't stand to minister, meaning they went out in the power. Now all of a sudden there's a son. He's listening to the wrong advice. He's getting full of himself, a little strong in himself. And all of a sudden, he starts relying on his own programs rather than going for the presence. In the midst of it, the enemy comes because of the division. He always will come when there's a division. He came and he stole these gold shields. Now, here is what the man should have did. You still in my gold shields? Oh, no, you didn't. We're going to fight now. Come on, somebody. We're going to fight. No, no, no. This is what it should have been like. Number one, you are not coming up here still in the glory. You're not coming up here. The dude not only didn't put up a fight, he substituted brass shields in their place. Rather than contend for the gold, a standard, he got something that had the glitz. He had something that had a little bit of shine, and we'll talk about it, but he wouldn't fight him for the gold. And I believe are we today in danger from c shack there are many that will settle for second rate kind of christian experience or just as good substitute rather than those that will simply say and you know what tell you what it took as much energy for you to replicate and substitute them brass shields as it would have been because the bible says that king rehoboam's soldiers that whenever he entered the temple they would get the brass shields and put them out and then when he left, they would pick him up and, and bring him back. Why? Because they didn't want it to come under too close of an inspection by others that it wasn't gold. It was brass. 
And I'm like, you can do all that energy of going back and carrying these shields. You did all that energy of forming the brass shields. Why couldn't you just put that energy into fighting for the gold shields? We work so hard to put on our programs. We work so hard to implement all the different, and, and there could be good godly programs, but in the midst of it, is there somebody praying and contending for the presence? Is there, I, I got three people to clap. Come on, I got Greg clapping for me. Hey, is there someone that says the gold standard is that we want revival? We don't want a good service. We want a God service. We don't want to just feel good. We want a community to feel God. Have we changed the end zone? Someone switched the goalpost on us. And instead of saying, hey, I'm going to get up early. We're going to pray. We're going to dig some wells. I'm going to seek God. Lord, whatever we got to do, this is it. Oh, my God. They say, according to statistics of Barna and others, the emerging generation, Gen Z, 1% save believe the Bible to be true, go to church. We previously had somewhere between one and 6% in the previous generation, but I guarantee you that has dwindled off due to this last season. What does a nation look like when less than 1% of them believe in God? I don't know, but I don't want to find out. Church, what we do right now will determine the next five years. I believe our window is shorter than we think. We got to fight, church. We got to fight. I know that's... I, <laughs> I know we want to soak, soak, but get up and fight after you soak. Come on, somebody. Come on, God didn't call us to a spa. He called us to a war. Come on, somebody. We got a war. Paul likened it to a soldier. The Bible tells us to fight the good fight. A good fight, I, when I was a kid and I had a good fight, it wasn't the one where I got a busted lip and a bloody nose and I'm limping home. That was a bad fight. A good fight is one I win. When Paul said fight the good fight, in other words, he's saying there's victory in this. Thanks be to God who always leads us in tribe. The rest will be the Lord. Trace my hands for war, my fingers for battle. Seashack comes and tries to steal the joy of our salvation. So we fill it with other activities. We try to make out with false religious enthusiasm. We, we settle for spiritual pep meetings in some instances, not this group, instead of true spiritual power. It's easier to develop an argument as to why it isn't happening than to contend that it would happen. And I'm telling you, the luxury is over for substitutes. I don't want revival. Excuse me. I don't want something like revival. I want revival. I don't want something like chicken. I want chicken. I want the real. What do we got to do to get the real? Come on, somebody. I love what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon said, you don't have to defend the Bible. He says, it's a lion. You just loose it and it will defend itself. Awesome. But let me add a little something to that. It may be true that you don't have to defend in that sense. Obviously, we defend our faith, but it's a lion. But you also are responsible to defend your heart, your home, and your hunger for God. You have to defend that. And I think there comes a point where we have to get back into that mindset that we are like, like combat boot wearing bride. Man, we got bridal affections, but we got our combat boots on. Come on, see the bride. She got her combat. I see the church getting her combat boots on. Come on. We had the little glass slippers, but this ain't Cinderella, somebody. This is war. Come on. We're going to get our combat boots. Come on, man. Somebody. We... we <laughs> We're going off Hallmark to the History Channel now. We got to fight some wars, y'all. I believe there's a warning. The warning is the ever-present threat to lose shields. You can lose shields. Hebrides Revival in 1949 is a series of islands off Scotland. They said at that point in time that in that late stage, 1949, the church wasn't thriving as it once did. Many churches were closing their doors. There was a spiritual indifference amongst the church. They said literally the testimonies of people that they say the churches were dead. They were in a spiritual winter. They said legalism was strong. And they said the churches were largely bereft of any young people. And as a result of that, people on the island had, if you, had, if you will, a form of godliness. They could have just wrote it out. But guess what? Two ladies, 82 and 84, Peggy and Christine Smith. Come on, somebody. You got to love their last name. Smith, I love that, all right? These women couldn't even go to church. They were shut-ins. One had back arthritis. One was blind. But these ladies hearing about what's going on at church. Come on, they had virtual church, but they had a good reason to be. 
but they said it's not okay to accept the substitute that we're just going to put in more special effects and spend more money on the screens and all that stuff. We don't have, if we have a dead church and we don't have young people getting saved. That's not okay. These women began to seek God. They began to war. They did what Rehoboam wouldn't do. They began to fight. As a result of that, God gave them a download. They sent for Duncan Campbell. He came and preached. Revival broke out. The night he preached, they said there were a hundred young people that had been at the party. They over here clubbing. Come on, y'all. They was, they was doing their little dance. Power of God, conviction came on them. They left the club, all began to walk towards this small little church. They didn't make it. Hundred people laid out in their power with several hundred others trying to get church by morning. They're laid out in the streets. Buses begin to show up. Literally, prostitute rings became intercessory prayer groups. Come on, the police had nothing to do, right? Because there was no crimes. They said in any given city, you heard people praying. They were praying in, in jubilation. They'd gotten saved, praying that somebody would get saved. Come on, somebody. Or praying that they would continue in the mark of what God has. Revival broke because two women did the exact opposite of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, here's what we know about brass. You have to constantly polish brass. You don't have to polish gold for the most part. They say that the, the people who would handle coins, right? That you could rub literally brass. This is why I think you tell brass from gold. You could rub it and it stinks a little bit if it's brass. If it's gold, it keeps its aroma. And I think that somehow we've substituted something because in some instances, there's a little bit of stink. We just call it with a stink. When stink stays and has staying power, it's stank. Okay, y'all got any teenagers where they got, they come in the house with some stank on them, okay? Come on, somebody. Solomon had died five years ago, and in five years, he goes from gold to brass. And I'm like, dude, why didn't you fight? What are you going to tell your kids? The dude just put brass shields in their place. It looks like it glitters, but here's the problem. Solomon had the glow, but Rehoboam, the son, all he had was the show. And if we're not careful, the enemy will cause, and I'm not saying that I think you're the high watermark, trust me. But if we don't go back and contend for greater works where we're at, it's cool that we all gather together, but somehow God has given you impartation that whatever city, country, church, it could be every place from a small country storefront to a mega church or whatever it is that God has you at. And every church is important is going after God. But we need some folks that will go back contending and saying that is not just for the show. I want the glow. I'm into martial arts. And if I can get kind of some music playing, we're almost, well, no, actually, give me five minutes, start some music. I'm going to close this. Give me five minutes because I want to give you three points of what you need to do closely at the end. Three prescriptions. There was a movie back in the day called The Last Dragon. I guarantee you the vast majority of you never heard of it. it, it oh, come on, come on. So, oh, yeah. The, the Last Dragon had, it was kind of an African-American dude that kind of was influenced by Bruce Lee, and he called himself Bruce Leroy, and he had to fight an antagonist called Show Enough. And Show Enough had his croonies, and he'd go, who's the baddest? And he'd go, Show Enough. Who's the baddest? Show Enough. And then Bruce... Leroy, this guy is called, actor by the name of Timok, and they had this singer that was associated at the time with an artist formerly known as Prince or Prince Vanity, who Denise Matthews later begot save and became a mighty evangelist. That all of a sudden, his whole quest in the movie, I'm not necessarily recommending the movie, but I thought about it, is he was searching for the glow because he thought that if he could get the glow, then he can defend his family. He could defend any type of fight because he wasn't like a bully at all. He was very, in a sense, very passive, but very honoring, very person respectful. And all of a sudden, you could see the trajectory that Show Enough and Bruce Leroy was going to ultimately have their battle. And at the end, Bruce, uh, uh, Show Enough had a, like a little, not really a glow. He had something on him, but he was just beating him down bad. And I'm in the movie theater in the city of Oakland. I'm like, come on, man. Come on, y'all. You hate to see that, the good guy. He's getting beaten. All of a sudden, show enough starts grabbing the protagonist, Bruce Lewis, and dips his head in water. He's going back and forth. And all of a sudden, he's going in the water, and he's just tormenting. But ultimately, he's, he's trying to take him out. That he's just in the water. He gets flashbacks of his entire journey. And in the midst of it, he's searching for this elusive glow but in the midst of it, he discovered he had the glow all along. And when he comes to that one time, you know, he's going kind of like I'm fighting for breath. And the next time he comes up amazingly calm. And then the music starts, you know, oh, it's on. Come on. All those little kids 
And if you go to black inner city theaters, we talking to the screen. Yeah, man, get him now. Come on. So if you want a quiet theater experience, don't come to the hood, okay? Because we, we are, we are call-out, call-back culture, right? And so we're doing it. And all of a sudden, man, he gets the glow back and he beats the dude down, gets the girl, protects his family. His brother had been kidnapped by this guy, gets it all back. And I feel like in this season, God wants the church to discover you had the glow all along. Christ in you is the hope of glory. We're searching for something that we think will give us peace, something we think will give us relevance. But in our quest for cultural relevance, I think we've become irrelevant because the thing that makes us relevant is the anointing, is the presence, is a loving heart. If having a Christ man, dove eyes of obsession on Christ. Somebody said, I got to get the gold back. Brass gets in when the church is more concerned about big crowds and big budgets than a big move of the spirit. And I'm telling you, I think you're with me. I just want a big move of the spirit. Now, here it is, and I need to land this. Solomon had the glow, Rehoboam had the show. Oh, okay, I gotta share this story. How many of you give me like, like seven more minutes? Okay, all right. During World War II, right at the beginning of that, there was a group of people in the Southwest Islands. This is in a book by David Hand called The Improbability Principle. And he describes the natives of the South Pacific Island. They had little, if any, contact with the outside world until the Allied forces landed there during World War II. And then they were mesmerized by the Allied forces' uniforms, marching in perfect order, the construction of airstrips, the hand gestures, all that kind of stuff, the, the, the directing of landing of incredible flying ships that they could not even imagine all kind of exotic goods they brought the cargo of coca-cola come on somebody you notice the theme in this message coca-cola right canned foods clothes basic medicine other unfamiliar yet desirable you know accruements and all of a sudden of course war ends and subsides allied forces leave and this simple culture when the war ended in the mysterious visitors left. Here's what David Hand wrote in this book. He says, the natives were disappointed, but they believed that the planes would return if they could mimic the action of what they believe were the heavenly visitors so they could get more fascinating gifts and healing medicines. So on the South Pacific Island, the natives built a control tower, listen to this, out of ropes and bamboo, a runway out of straw, they made clothed uniforms resembling the military uniforms they observed. They carved out wooden headsets. They mimicked the landing strip like motions and gestures. And they believed that these patterns of beliefs and rituals known as the cargo cults, the faithful believer, if they simply followed the pattern and the motions of the technologically superior visitors, they would get the same results and they would get back to Coca-Cola, they would get back all the good stuff. But how many of you know it didn't happen? We laugh at this, but I don't know if it's really any different of reading about revival and all of a sudden want what the fruit of revival is by substituting man-made synthetic things rather than contending for the original gold. Let me give you three things and then we're going to be done. Are you guys still with me? Touch somebody and say, accept no substitutes. Come on. All right. Here we go. And I think you understand this. I believe right now that there needs to be a distinction. We can't be a sort of Christian. We cannot be an almost Christian. You cannot be a part-time worshiper or a full-time God. It's got to be pedal to the metal, full throttle. You guys get that? I don't even need to preach that. So let me give you right now, and obviously there's all these substitutes, but what do you have to do to get from having the brass to getting the gold back? This is something the king wouldn't do. And if I can get someone to come or play, yeah, play music, whatever you got to do, right? Here we go. Number one, and it's so important, you got to recognize the difference. Can I say that? And I love this, that in this conference, on this platform, I've heard some of the most anointed, authentic, real hearted. I was so blessed last night. Dr. Randy got up and shared those stories and the power of God that was demonstrated. I thank God for generals like him and Dr. Tom and others and Will and people that are in Global Awakening that are contending. This isn't your normal conference. Chris and I do a lot of conferences and we love running with Global Awakening. Anytime they ask us, and we probably have done 
uh, six to eight different ones. And even some during 2020, we we're supposed to be at that got canceled. We we're bummed because we just wanted to hang out with them. But this is a group that's contending for a gold standard. This is the anti Rehoboam forces. You got to recognize the difference. We got to recognize the difference when we go, that's personality, that's not presence. We can end this cult of celebrity pastors in a minute and say it isn't about the following on social media. It's about you following the cloud of God because we need an encounter with Jesus. It isn't about what sound. Let me tell you, in this generation, this is my notice. I mentor some dudes. We have some of the best communicators of some of these young guys growing up. And one of the things that I, my wife and I endeavor to pour into them, enough to where over the 2020, we started a podcast because we wanted to disciple and just, come on, somebody shouted. Somebody heard our podcast. That's awesome. Uh, it's on Charisma platform. No. <laughs> Shameless plug. But I've, and I say this, Lord, please help me say this. I say this and offer this in all humility, knowing I got a D plus in high school speech. I, I don't consider myself this great communicator at all. In fact, I feel like out of the weakness and inadequacy of being a D plus in high school speech, it gets on my face and saying, God, let them not just hear from me, but let them hear from the Holy One of Israel. I hear some of the best communication, but I don't sense the presence. It's like, dude, what you just said, that was verbal gymnastics, dude. You just landed on it. Come on, Simone Bile. You know, you just nailed it. But I don't sense the presence. It's like, man, your book is awesome. It's got all the stuff. But where is the true gospel in the midst of it? Your tweet is awesome, but about a decade ago, that was in the self-help section of Barnes & Nobles because it's self-help at best. Where is God in that and calling for a God dependency? If we're going to give back gold shields, number one, you got to recognize the difference. You got to discern the rip off. You got to say, no devil, I'm not, I'm not going to settle for my kid just staying alive. I'm not going to settle for my kid just being safe. I'm believing they're going to walk in the fullness of their destiny. I'm believing that man, the fullness of God. I'm not going to settle that they just off drugs until they're on their calling. I'm going to keep praying. I'm a, I can discern the difference. I'm not satisfied with substitutes. Number two, I told you I'd go quick. Number one, recognize the difference. Number two, you got to resolve to have the real. That's why my heart burns and your heart burns for revival. God brought you here to mark you at a whole nother level for revival. Revival isn't just a series of special meetings that we all get excited about. If, if revival, and there's revival in the house, there's an atmosphere of revival here. But if I walk up them doors and after a week or so I lost my fire, then I didn't fully take advantage because I didn't walk with revival fire. All I had was a hot flash. Come on somebody. Cause if you get fire, but you lose your fire, <laughs> that's a hot flash. I want to be a flaming torch for God. I want to be a hot flash. The problem is at Pentecost, the church began with shields of gold and someone on the line brass gets in. Every revival is about a recovery of the gold. I want a gold. I want a heart of gold. I want to have passion for Jesus. I, I want to literally be so in love with Jesus that I, there's an inability for me to be offended because I've seen and you've seen so much offense in this season. I resolve to have real love. I don't want that kind of love that you have to look like me, vote like me, have the same socioeconomic status as me and all that stuff for me to love you. That's substitute brass. I want gold. I want a love that will cross the aisle. I want a love that will love folks different than me. I want a love that will transcend the generations. I want a love that loves folks through the sin. Come on, somebody, because they're not the enemy. They're captives of the enemy. I want to have the real. I want the, I, amen. I want an awesome service. I want an awesome series and I'm preaching. I'm a pastor, but hey, God, you can blow this stuff to the side. I want one intervention of God. One thousands of sermons literally cannot contain the power of one deviated interruption of the power of God showing up. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you like the content that you receive from this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also, give us a thumbs up and share our content with all of your friends and family. It really helps us out. We also invite you to consider partnering with us. We're a nonprofit ministry with a mission to awaken the world to the power of the gospel. If you'd like to help us continue creating content, consider giving at the link on the screen or text the word donation to 21,000. 
If you want even more of our spirit-filled content, consider a subscription to globalondemand.tv, our subscription video platform. Thanks for watching.